Um, so we thought we'd have a kind of lightweight, inconsequential conversation with somebody who didn't matter very much. So I'm going to be chatting to Roy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in mean, for a tough time tonight, I think. Anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, who was here last time uh, we had a chat with Simon? Put your hand up. Oh, only one or two of you. Okay, fine. Well, that gives us a bit of a steer on what we're going to do. If you've just joined us on Periscope, good evening. Welcome to the King's Fund, the overpriced King's Fund. It's lovely to see you. And, um, and welcome to our guest. First of all, it would be great, I think, if we could have our traditional message from our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. He's here. I can't believe it. It's the fabulous, unbelievable. It's Michael Sick. <laughs> It's um, quite difficult to get a microsecond on Roy's stage, isn't it? But uh, thank you anyway. <laughs> thank you, that's enough. That's <laughs> it's all we have time for. <laughs> See, give him a, a millimetre, he'll take a mile. Uh, a great welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for coming. It's our pleasure to sponsor it, as always, uh, with such a, a wonderful guest also. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Good. There's nothing like a good introduction, and that was nothing like a good introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, change that tape, please. <laughs> and Patrick is here. Stand up, Patrick. We just uh, say a big thank you to Patrick. Uh, also, to the unsung heroes who uh, are, are outside. What? Yeah, I know. I'm, well, I'm going to let you do that later on. Yeah. Uh, the unsung heroes outside uh, from Salix who managed our front of house since we were starting out, and we're very grateful to them. And of course, to our special guest, Simon Stevens. Now we thought we'd we have a new a new gimmick this this time, right? We're going to make it a bit different. We've got the steady hand test, Simon. Right. Okay. <laughs> So this is, a, this is a new test that uh, NHS England, I think, are going to be employing for all managers. Uh, we thought we'd start with you. Yeah, sure. Okay, would you like to start? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I, no, I'll tell you what. I just... Oh, Christ, hang on. I'll do it first, okay? And, and I'll show you how to do it. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's... Okay. Fine, easy. so it's pretty easy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and now I'll turn it on. Uh, you can have a shot. Yep. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I think <laughs> Actually, actually, Roy, it looks like the sort of thing that might be installed in a Texas penitentiary. Um, if the going gets rough. Right, right, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, draw available. Well, okay, right. Anyway, so you can all have a go at that later on. Well, Simon, thank you very much for coming. Um, and that concludes this evening's entertainment. Yes, thank you very much. Can we all get to the bar and do some much more important stuff? Um, thank you for coming. I know you've had a busy day. You've been busy with cancer today, have you? Yes. Um, in fact, <laughs> Little notice uh, on uh, Friday, we uh, saw the cancer outcomes uh, statistics for England. So there was a big uh, meeting today called uh, Britain Against Cancer. And what the uh, figures on uh, Friday showed is that over the last year, cancer care in the NHS in England has got better, such that 2,400 families are going to have uh, loved ones who are going to be with them this Christmas who would not have been around last Christmas. So that's what a 0.8% increase in the one year survival rate for all cancers means when you've got 300,000 people getting a new cancer diagnosis. So we obviously have a big debate about all sorts of things in the NHS but what we tend to forget is that on most of the big killers and uh, disablers actually the quality of care is getting better and that is clearly evident in cancer. But what I was also doing was um, some very tangible uh, action to upgrade the radiotherapy equipment on offer in hospitals across the country. Uh, last time we had a big upgrade was about uh, 15 years so, ago. Um, uh, so I just said we're getting some comments the, the volume isn't great so I don't know if it's the microphones okay. or whether you might be able to speak up a little bit. Is it on? I might have disconnected myself at that uh, point. Yeah, so I can yeah. think of no finer thing. <laughs> <laughs> Right, exactly better. <laughs> well, let's see. I'm sure Periscope will tell us if we haven't yes, quite so got it right. Speak. right. Um, well, so the point I was really making is that about 15 years ago, 
on the back of lottery funding, we had a big uh, replacement. Didn't Alan for, Milburn put a lot of stuff in as well? What, uh, yeah, so when cancer, and, and then we had no staff to, to, to operate it. No, we did. And what, a lot of what happens with uh, cancer is that we focus on the new cancer drugs, but actually, it's actually surgery and radiotherapy which makes a big difference to cancer uh, survival and uh, treatment success. So anyway, we're now kicking off the biggest upgrade in radiotherapy we've had for 15 years. Uh, the first 15 hospitals are getting their new radiotherapy machines in the next four months, which is pretty darn good. It is good. I, I've never really understood the cancer stuff because uh, 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 on one level we're supposed to be very good at cancer, on another level we're not. But if you actually look at the data, it's collected by Eurostat, and Germany, for example, uh, Germany, for example, don't uh, 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 count all their data. In France, it's done on a different basis. Outcomes are measured. I mean, the Eurostat data upon which we are uh, compared isn't great, is it? No, I think it shows that we've still got lots of opportunities to improve cancer outcomes yeah. in this country. And in fact, there's still you know, a big variation between different parts of the country. The good news is that that variation has uh, fallen by about a quarter um, since 1999. So the parts of the country that were doing worst on their cancer outcomes uh, 15 years ago are catching up faster. And so we've been narrowing the gap as well as improving cancer outcomes overall. And, and what is it with uh, early presentation? It seems that the big issue around yeah. cancer is the earlier you get diagnosed, the better it is. And we, is it, I mean, is it because the GPs don't recognise the cancer as often as they should? Is it because we don't go to the GP as often? Is it about access to the GP? It seems to be a whole story, particularly around blue collar male workers where the outcomes are poorer. Yes, and also um, for some uh, black and minority ethnic uh, patients, uh, services are not um, accessible or people are not presenting um, uh, soon enough. So the big cancers where this is a real issue are lung cancer and colorectal cancer. And we've got far too many patients who are getting diagnosed when they're uh, so far advanced in their illness that actually the ability to really uh, produce a big benefit from treatment is, is much diminished. And you know, the paradox with uh, bowel cancer is that if you are diagnosed right early on at stage one, then nine out of 10 patients are alive 10 years later. If you're diagnosed at stage four, then nine out of 10 patients, unfortunately, are But it's are so horrible, isn't it? I mean, to, to, to get, you know, you've got to start fishing around the kazi with a spoon to, to do the sample. And it's just Neanderthal. There must be a better test. Is that what the Neanderthals did? <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't have a kazi. They fished around the pile. But, I mean, it's, it, you know, the... We've got good news on that front, what, Roy, what, actually, uh, on the fishing around in the kazi front. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that is the reason that, that uh, you have to do what you just described is up until now we've been using a screening test uh, called uh, FOV, fecal occult blood test that actually requires six scoops and you need to keep it in the fridge um, uh, do you put it that, above the cooked meats or below the <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, however well, there's, there's a Duncan, new where's there's Duncan a Selby that you need for that <laughs> there's a new uh, bowel cancer screening test called FIT that actually only requires one a scoop fart, is it? and uh, <laughs> fart. one scoop what? And, uh, oh what an improvement <laughs> yeah. one and scoop. we're not talking ice cream here yeah. um, and the point is that that's likely to improve up. Isn't there a uh, blood test for this or something else? Well, no, this, this is actually going to make a big difference uh, and then as that's rolled out it will also mean that uh, more people will come forward for uh, uh, kind of still screening. Fish uh, around in the oh. No, I think this, uh, this has been shown box. to make a big, a big uh, improvement to the uptake. At the moment only about half the people complete the six scoop screening. Um, and the uh, one scoop. What are we doing? Uh, <laughs> all the things we're I don't know, doing you started it. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> I was talking I about radiotherapy them. machines. <laughs> yeah, the blonde is a cut of red. This is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Loving it. She works where the sun don't shine all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we'll miss your lily. Yeah, that's why I get on. Yeah, I'm managing so well because he's a, yeah, you got it. Do you know that tonight's not going so well? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm sorry I asked you what kind of a day you had, really. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your beard, for God's sake. What's that right. all about? 
Well, it's laziness, basically. <laughs> I mean, I went on holiday in August um, uh, to... Tell uh, where you went. Well, I went to the North Pole, um, as you do on a Russian nuclear icebreaker. Just to get uh, away from the Daily Mail. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so this was a couple of weeks, and I kind of just let it all run to seed during that period. And uh, so my wife kind of, you know, said, oh, it's all right for now. And then the kids sort of said, ah, keep it for a bit. Um, so kind of each weekend, I think, OK, it's time to go. But as my son pointed out to me, it's kind of proof positive that we are way past peak hipster if I've got a beard. <laughs> Thanks for that, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your son sounds very cool. Look, uh, uh, there will be a lot of people in the audience who haven't um, uh, uh, heard you speak before. You know, the, That's uh, why they're here. And if no, they, they haven't on, they no, wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, Is that uh, what you're about to say? No, the, yeah. the last health chat. And, and I, I, I don't uh, want to visit some of the old ground, but I do think you, you do have a, an interesting background, which uh, I won't spend a great deal of time on because some people will have heard it before, but a lot haven't. And I think it does position you in an entirely... A different light because actually you you, you you come from up north although you don't sound to, as though you do anymore um, you were a Labour councillor as well I think which a lot of people will be surprised to know and yes I was, I was born in Birmingham and in fact was in Birmingham uh, last week and part of the conversation I was having with folks at the uh, NHS providers conference was just looking at the fact that not just the country but even you know cities like Birmingham are cities divided and you know there's a 10 year life expectancy difference between different uh, wards across uh, the city of Birmingham and it so happens that the uh, part of East Birmingham Shard End where I was born uh, is the bottom uh, is the worst uh, for life expectancy and male life expectancy in Shard End has actually been going down uh, the last several years uh, whereas for Birmingham as a whole and indeed for the country as a whole it's been going up so I think it's kind of good that we stay focused on some of these inequalities that are not being cracked um, but then sort of fast forward and forward, yes, I was for a few years, uh, four years, uh, a councillor in Brixton, and that's obviously a different experience, uh, but I think I'm probably the only person doing my job uh, from the NHS point of view who has also sort of previously been on the local government side of the fence, so I kind of see it from both angles in a way. Have you given up political ambition? <laughs> sure. Or would you yeah. turn back to that? No, I didn't. I never had political ambition. I mean, uh, I, you know, signed on for the NHS, uh, back in 20, uh, 28 years ago um, and then sort of done various healthcare related jobs and that's been what I've been Because you had a very motivated. interesting job at number 10, didn't you, Tony Blair's? Yeah, I spent seven years uh, at uh, number 10 of the Department of Health uh, in the uh, late 90s and the uh, first half of the 2000s, uh, but interspersed that with kind of jobbing healthcare management uh, jobs around the NHS, uh, the States, um, Brazil, China, other places. Yeah. It's an interesting back catalog. Right, well, let's get up to date, really. I mean, I suppose the big topic um, is um, the 200-week forward view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how's it going? Well, we're in year one of the spending review. Uh, and I think 2016-17, although there are kind of huge pressures right across the NHS, entirely predictable given a growing population, an aging population, all the financial constraints we're facing. Actually, 2016-17 this year is going to be a year when I think we're going to make quite a lot of progress relative to where we were last year. I mean, even on the, the sort of basic question of um, deficits in uh, hospital trusts, I think we're on track to have cut hospital uh, deficits by uh, more than two thirds. I think we will have made some clear initial steps on uh, helping GPs and um, trying to reverse the um, issues that have uh, arisen in mental health services is a poor relation over many, many years. And I think that um, alongside that, the process we've been using locally to try and ensure that people are thinking beyond their own individual organisation but a shared point of view as to how their health system should develop, uh, the STP process, I think you know, that's not perfect, but it's moved the conversation along and strengthened relationships. Uh, which were otherwise somewhat under pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of get that, but of course they've, um, they've had a bad start, haven't they, really? Because I think people got the wrong end of the stick about what they were doing. There was a whole load of accus accusations, not least from Chris here, who was talking about STPs in secret planning and all the rest of them. They, they kind of, the communications bit got off to a bad start, don't you think? I think there's a kind of there's a you know circle to be squared here. Forty out of forty-four SDPs have now been published, and the remaining four will be published by the end of next week. And the truth is that in most of the country, uh, 
that has kind of uh, <coughs> happened without the mushroom cloud going up. So I think uh, you know it's not unreasonable that people have a chance to kind of debate through uh, proposals before they set hairs running uh, in public. But what's quite clear is we're now at the point where we've got to turn the proposals into concrete plans. And in order to do that, we've got to have much greater engagement and discussion with frontline uh, nurses, therapists, docs, and local communities. And that's what the next several months will be about. I mean, you know yourself as a councillor, as a former councillor, certainly I did, that the, uh, it, the consultation process could kill this off, really, I think. Um, it's easy, I think, for communities to delay real substantial change, and some of the STPs are substantial change. Uh, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but it, you know, it's still a substantial change. So, you know, it's simple enough, really, to to stall the consultation process, and you end up with all the judicial review and all that. I mean, finding a way through that, it seems to me, is now the next big job. Yes, although I would say that actually, the sort of content, the the sort of active ingredients in most of these local uh, local proposals, is not. Uh, for the most part, the controversial stuff around, you know, um, where will the maternity service be located or what are we doing with the A&E department? Actually, what most people are working on is how do they um, help GPs uh, come together to create, um, you know, urgent care, hubs, uh, other services that would relieve some of the pressure otherwise flowing in the hospital. They're pretty clear they've got the memo, uh, the message uh, that we can't keep grading mental health uh, services uh, to bail out other parts of the system, so they're, I think, pretty clear about needing to change that. And there's also a kind of bigger debate around some of the uh, way the workforce is deployed. Uh, none of those things are the sort of classics of, you know, public consultation on hospital reconfiguration. But are there some of those? Sure there are. Some of them, I think, are long overdue. Uh, there's a public consultation just being launched uh, within the last several days uh, down in Dorset, for example, uh, which is proposing bringing together uh, Bournemouth and Poole hospitals. And for those of you with not that long memories, yes. you'll recall that uh, two or three years ago, that very idea was blocked on the grounds that it would reduce the competition between the two hospitals that are eight miles apart. Um, so I think, you know, the fact that we're now able to kind of get a bit more kind of, you know, partnership and uh, planning back into the system, and they'll have that dialogue with the uh, folks around uh, South Dorset, and I think uh, there's a good chance they're going to be able to pull that off. Two percent of the overall savings are supposed to be coming up eh, from reduction in demand, and uh, Duncan Selby's had a rattle a few bars by saying that the public health agenda has been neglected by a lot of the STPs. Where, where do you think we're going to go with that? Because that actually, I, I think that's a good thing because it binds the local authorities much more in, into this, doesn't it? We have some of the areas, it seems to me, we have approached it in a very, uh, in just a clinical model rather than the whole engagement across uh, the communities. Well, I do think local government, although, you know, often the health is a bit sniffy about local government, but I mean, I do think local government does have a big role to play in this. It does. Obviously, local government's under pressure, given the uh, sort of budgets uh, that uh, they've got at their disposal. And there are things that local government can do that aren't about uh, funding services, but are about using their broader either regulatory uh, powers or ability to kind of mobilise change across a, across a geography. Uh, there are things that national government needs to do, and I personally uh, thought it was pleasing to see government holding its nerve yesterday on the uh, sugar tax proposals <coughs> on um, uh, sugary drinks, given the impact we know they're having on uh, childhood obesity. And then there are kind of other broader changes that you sort of don't notice kind of year by year, but actually the compound effect of which is far more profound than a lot of what we spend all our time talking about. So the fact that one million fewer adults are smoking than five years ago, I mean, that is huge. I mean, 8 million down to 7 million, that is going to have a profound impact on uh, future improvements in cardiovascular disease and cancer rates. And it's part of the reason why, over the last 10 years, we've had a 44% reduction in the premature death rate from cardiovascular disease, which is incredible, actually. I mean, think about that, 44% fewer heart attacks and strokes for people aged under 75. If that hadn't happened, then, I mean, just think how jam-packed our A&Es would be, uh, and they already are. Yes. <laughs> they are. They are. What are you doing about it? 
Well, I think there are five sets of things that we believe, based on what people say uh, appears to work in different parts of the health service, that need to uh, get sorted out. Uh, one of them is around um, changes to the way the uh, 111 uh, service works. We've got about 14 million calls uh, to that each year. We want to have a higher proportion of those calls that are actually getting to talk to a nurse or a paramedic or a doctor uh, rather than a call handler. That's been shown to then uh, provide more expert advice and fewer people getting referred uh, to a hospital. And and secondly, well, uh, a bit of common sense. You are. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, there are changes that are being tested in ambulance services around the country uh, to give uh, ambulance uh, ambulance services uh, more ability to an extra 120 seconds to figure out uh, what sort of ambulance response is required. Because what's been happening is, if you have a very short period of time to do that, then multiple ambulances are dispatched, and a lot of them then get turned away en route because they find that they're not needed or they're diverted from another more urgent job. So it's not a sensible way of... So there are various other changes in the ambulance service that will be part of this. Then there are changes at the front door of a and &E departments so that you've actually got what's called streaming uh, so that you uh, figure out if somebody needs effectively a, a primary care service there and then, GP service, they're not sort of feeding straight through into the kind of, you know, the A bit and the E bit of the hospital. It's not actually an accident, it's not an emergency, but it's something we can do uh, there and then. Fourthly, there are uh, flow issues through the hospital um, and that is around um, things like uh, whether patients are being uh, reviewed uh, on a timely basis, uh, whether they're having their medications written up the night before they're likely to be discharged, uh, the proportion of patients who are uh, <coughs> to be discharged home before midday, because otherwise we've got too many hospitals that basically operate like a hotel where uh, the guests uh, for tomorrow check in before the guests for yesterday check out, uh, and that's kind of uh, what we mean when we talk about flow. Um, and then the last piece is that the back end, we've obviously got lots of kind of uh, delays when people are ready to be looked after um, back home or uh, in some form of uh, social care, ensuring that that uh, works smoothly. And there are all sorts of practical things that we know about. So it's a long answer, but the answer is really, if we do those five things, then it's going to certainly put us in a much better position. I mean, from our travels around the country with the Academy of Fabulous Stuff, there's a shed load of really good stuff going on and it's not all silver bullet it's silver buckshot stuff and some of it's quite s small really but it but it aggregates to making uh, a big difference and, yeah and, you know we see see it all the time at the easiest conference that we were at today again you know there's some really good stuff going on but but you're, we're still left i think with uh the big problem and that's uh, getting people home. I mean, we, we've seen some great stuff on uh, discharge to assess, yep. which when I first saw it, I thought you're having a laugh. This, you know, your granny's going to get marooned and no one's going to do anything. But I think Nottingham pioneered it, and we've uh, we've used we've pioneered. We, was it? Who was Aintree. It? it was Aintree. Aintree saying. did yeah. it. Well, Aintree we, we did it. Well, yeah, South Warwickshire. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, they copied uh, it. I mean, we. Yeah, we it, it was one difference. of the most popular things we had on the academy. Mm -hmm. and a shed load of people have, have copied it and been to see them. Uh, but it does, of course, mean uh, getting uh, social care ducks in a row. I mean, uh, it was disappointing, wasn't it, that there was no more money for social care in the autumn review? Well, uh, as you know, I certainly have said that if more money becomes available, then I think yes. there's a very strong case for social care being uh, front of the queue. And, you know, I think that's uh, not given up on the idea that uh, that's what we will come about. Do you think that the, the Chancellor will come back with more money? Do you think? Um, I'm, as I said, I've not given up on the uh, idea that uh, the case will be uh, will be heard. Well, it, I mean, it has to be, doesn't it? We can't carry on with social care the way it is. They've had their budgets cut to ribbons, haven't they? And, uh, and now we're seeing, of course, um, it's not perhaps in your bailiwick, but we are seeing now some serious threats to the cohesion of the whole sector of hair, domiciliary care and, and <coughs> care homes. I mean, uh, Four Seasons made some very uh, <coughs> sinister comments to their shareholders just recently about their funding model not being sustainable at the present time. I mean, well, I think we're facing what could be a pretty dramatic time in that sector. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of kind of moving parts there, aren't there? I mean, one of the things that's happening is obviously the, um, as a result of the uh, good news, uh, the increase in the uh, uh, 
national uh, living wage, that's putting pressure at just the same time as local authorities have got less uh, ability to fund uh, people uh, who would otherwise qualify for uh, public support. And then you've rightly got uh, much greater transparency, um, external um, look at the uh, quality of care on offer inside care homes and your favourite organisation CQC is obviously kind of, uh, helping with that. Well they'll be closed um, and we'll save 250 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so I just thought I'd like blue touch paper and see what sort of exposure we got there but uh, it's quite mute actually by your standards. Uh, so yes there are all those pressures um, but there are also, uh, I don't want to be sort of you know Anglossian about it but there are parts of the country where despite all that actually they're doing some stuff together that really make a difference. So if you look at Oxfordshire, um, the Oxford Radcliffe Hospital has managed to substantially cut the number of patients who are um, unable to get uh, discharge and support back home <coughs> because they themselves have sort of got more involved in the uh, out of hospital community health and uh, social care provision. If you look at uh, Tameside in Greater Manchester, um, interestingly the local authority has is going to uh, transfer over their uh, social care staff to the Tameside Acute Trust. If you look at uh, Plymouth, the community health services and the social care staff have gone into a joint community interest uh, company. So there are all kinds of David, interesting examples. David Dalton is, is yes, hard. Is it 300 uh, social services employees? They've just yep. tubed them across. Yep. So I think, that, know, does that lead us down the road to the <coughs> accountable care organisation <laughs> solution? Do you think? Uh, well, I think, in, in, yes, you've got to kind of think about what's happening on the care delivery side. And I think some of these examples are, are about bringing together teams of people. Uh, but on the other side of the kind of equation is whether or not you're pooling budgets. And places like Sheffield have gone much further in pooling their budgets than uh, is the minimum required. But it still comes down to the point that, as I've said many times, just putting together two leaky buckets uh, from the NHS and social care doesn't produce a watertight funding solution. So actually the amount as well as the feeling does matter. Mm, I agree. Uh, there's a fantastic book about mergers uh, and, it's, and it's called Mergers Management and Mayhem and the subtitle is Two Turkeys Don't Make an Eagle. And uh, modesty prevents me from revealing the name of the author, but it's a really good book. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the money. I mean, it won't take long because there isn't any, is there? <laughs> now, am I, I, let me get this right. So we, we had two billion from last year. We've got eight billion from this year. Four billion has come from DH sources. So you take that off and you're left with 4.5 billion, which the Treasury says is 10 billion. And, and I just, I don't know, shit, how much money we got? <laughs> We've got more this year than we had last year. <laughs> I've not got as much extra as if the economy was sitting away, we might otherwise have hoped to expect. Yeah, never mind all that shit. I mean, <laughs> what kind of mess did you get into at number 10? <laughs> What? Well, no, what kind of mess did you get into with number 10? I don't recognise that. Uh, yeah, really? Description. Okay. Well, I think number 10 did, didn't they? Because they were pretty cross when you unpick the 10 billion and the 8 billion. No, I don't think so. Um, what I did was uh, answer a straight question at a parliamentary committee. And uh, of course, I feel under an obligation to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under those circumstances. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you know under all circumstances? Yeah. Certainly. Worth a round of applause, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, a, what a soft answer that was. Okay, right. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm just got an eye on the time. Let's uh, let's make the most uh, most of Simon's. Uh, uh, presence with us tonight. If you go home tonight thinking, I wish I'd asked that question, it's your own fault. What do you want to ask? Um, I'll start at the back. <laughs> yes. Sir. Would you mind standing? You stand up and you'll have to, you'll need, you'll need big breaths, darling. Uh, tell us who you are and your pen number, please. A what specialist? Oh yeah, well everything's fine with you. Sit down, let's <laughs> find something. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and testify the EPO from the moment. Um, according to CRUK, we're missing our cancer targets. We've been missing the loan for the previous four to six months. So, signs of an improvement in that trend. Um, but my key issue relates to preventable cancers. Because most patients with cancer, they don't want to get cancer. 
like radiotherapy machines, they're great, the surgery's great. They, they don't want cancer. And the real key is to try and prevent it. <laughs> and we say, well, it's been a good improvement in our smoking, um, but obesity is currently our, our second biggest preventing cause of cancer. And the children who are obese are five times more likely to be obese as adults. Yes. We had a perfect opportunity to try and address that with the childhood obesity strategy. Well, uh, I'm really sorry. Could you just paraphrase the question because they were yeah, so they got the answer. Yeah. I mean, basically, it was it was uh, first up the waiting times targets in cancer, and then secondly, childhood obesity and obesity in general is its contribution with respect to cancer. How are you looking at it? And the childhood obesity plan itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> yeah. So. It's right that on the, uh, particularly on the uh, Cancer 62 day target, there have been a huge increase in the number of people who have been referred by GPs for testing. And so although the numbers being uh, tested within 62 days are going up, uh, the proportions are not where we want them. So what are we gonna do about that? We've got to expand the diagnostic testing capacity. And that's why one of the things I announced this afternoon was a 200 million uh, fund over the next two years, precisely so that different parts of the country could do that. That in turn means we've got to deal with some of the workforce uh, gaps that exist uh, in various uh, parts of the um, uh, sort of provider, uh, cancer provider services. But I think uh, radiography, uh, sonography, and endoscopy would be three that would be uh, sort of top of the pile. There are many others as well, but those three. And so Health Education England have got a very specific set of goals to expand supply and improve retention uh, in those areas. And then I think we've got to also uh, do what the Cancer Task Force asks us to do, which is to try and streamline the um, sort of hodgepodge of different kind of uh, slightly confusing uh, waiting times targets that exist for bits of the cancer pathway. And their proposition was that we should replace that with a start to finish 28 day um, goal. And so we've got five parts of the country that are um, now getting going, uh, showing in practice what that would mean. And that's places like uh, Ipswich and uh, East Lancashire, uh, and uh, Bournemouth and other parts of other places to kind of really show the practicalities in terms of staffing and pathways and so on. So I think the point there is we need to expand diagnostic capacity and if the consequence of uh, reducing the threshold of concern which NICE has suggested from you know I think something like a 12% positive predictive value to 3% means many more people are going to be coming forward for testing so we've got to sort that out. But in a way that wasn't your question, that was just your warm-up. Uh, your actual question was then about uh, obesity as a risk factor of the cancer and in particular childhood obesity and uh, the childhood obesity strategy. Look, I mean the childhood obesity strategy is uh, produced by government, uh, it's not produced by the NHS. Uh, what I would say about it is that for the first time at least, it has set a quantitative goal of a 20% reduction uh, in childhood obesity. And if it uh, becomes apparent that we are not on track for that, then uh, to my mind, uh, that will very clearly suggest that uh, reinforcing measures are required over and above those that are set out in the uh, mark one of the uh, childhood obesity strategy that they published. Uh, again, about cancer. Would uh, you mind standing uh, on the Pavilion Health? Could you turn around as well so everybody can hear Hello. you? Hello. <laughs> uh, it's about uh, uh, cancer, and uh, NHS is uh, really a, a, a center of excellence, uh, clinical excellence. And on the other hand, uh, industry, pharmaceutical industry, and also universities are center of excellence, world center of excellence in, in research. And there is a feeling in cancer community that those uh, silos are actually not communicated as effectively as they can, especially uh, when it uh, uh, comes to uh, uh, data that NHS could provide, real-time data that are uh, uh, enormously important for, for, for research and any, any kind of further uh, input into clinical work basically bringing research results and innovation into in, into the clinic. So what what is being done? Yeah. That? yeah. Okay, so there were a very specific set of uh, proposals that came out of something called the Accelerated Access Review, which was published uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, chaired by um, a guy called Hugh Taylor and uh, John Bell, who's the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford. 
and that had some, uh, I think, very practical suggestions as to how to kind of try and uh, do what you rightly just described. Over and above that, as part of the uh, conversation we're having with the life sciences industry uh, in the run-up to Brexit, uh, we are um, very keen to ensure that we kind of harness the uh, biomedical research infrastructure in this country, the life sciences uh, industry assets that exist, and the contribution the NHS can make. And so we've got a fairly, um, uh, uh, I think, constructive dialogue now going on. And in places like Cambridge, say, you see the kind of uh, sweet spot where uh, the work of Adam Brooks, uh, the work of uh, Cambridge University uh, Medical School, the work of Cancer Research UK, and the big investment that AstraZeneca has made, uh, those four partners, uh, actually with MRC uh, funding as well, uh, and various others, uh, are all coming together in a pretty coherent fashion. So uh, I think uh, the point you make is right, and I think people are kind of now up for, given everything else going on with the country around Brexit, are kind of willing to kind of think uh, quite creatively about some new partnerships there. Can I uh, just, I'll, I'll, I'll get around the audience, don't worry, we've got, we got time. I just wanted to talk to you about the digital exemplars, um, whilst it's still in my mind, okay. It looks like mental health has come out of it not as well as we might have expected, given there's supposed to have parity of parity. No, I think what we're doing is um, implementing the recommendations that came out of the uh, Bob Wachter uh, review. And there are a set of issues in mental health services, but there are also a set of things we've got to get right in terms of um, uh, electronic health records and um, interoperability in hospital systems. We're actually in a pretty good position, as far as, as you know, as far as a GP uh, system is concerned. So I don't think there's a contradiction between saying we've got to kind of upgrade some of the hospital systems that can make the biggest progress, uh, with also saying that there are a set of things we need to bring uh, to mental health. And in fact, what we're trying to do on the mental health front is um, get uh, more um, engaged around um, digital uh, mental health apps. Um, there are a whole series of kind of possibilities there, and uh, Keith McNeil and Will Short and uh, Will Smart and uh, uh, Juliet Bauer, um, three kind of leadership. Mm. It's very nice to see Keith work. back in a leading yeah. role. He was a, he, he came and spoke to us. He was very impressive, and we're all big fans of Keith. Okay, uh, okay, fine. Uh, I will get. Uh, let's. Um, I'm going to work my way around methodically. Let's go to Sebastian to start with. Please, can I ask you to make these brief? Um, and if you don't, I'll just shut you up. Sebastian, you're a paediatrician. Um, our STP was published today. It was trailed last week and led to a campaign by local MPs and newspapers uh, to save our hospital. Which hospital? Uh, uh, George Elliott, Nuneaton. Right. So another campaign to save. And um, I think we need a real conversation locally, regionally and nationally about the truth, the choices, the challenges facing us, the options. and. What are your thoughts on that, given we live in this populist, post-truth world uh, where we don't believe in experts anymore? Can I just say, Michael Gove is my local MP. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's a complete prat. <laughs> um, well, you... <laughs> you, I guess, work at uh, the hospital, yeah. so... What's your? <laughs> I mean, moment. what's your what's your point of view on what is being proposed? Then, I mean, is is the code for what you're saying that you think that some of those proposed changes on maternity or children's services are right, and somehow people have got to kind of get with the program? Is that what you're saying? So, for 20 years, there's needed to be reconfiguration across the system, and um, and this is there's been a lot of struggles. And in fact, I went there to help set up a new service. And that's. I hope this isn't going out anywhere. But it's. It's not. I think you're broadcasting live to the people in Nuneaton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, it's all about as you can tell. Good evening, Nuneaton. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mill Point. <laughs> so I think that uh, change is needed. Um, but just this simple answer of. Just to say, by the way, Sebastian, here is Nuneaton News. Yes. And the headline is shock plans to close A and E maternity and children's care at Nuneaton Hospital. So yeah. that's what you're referring to, right? That's absolutely what I'm referring to. But what what comes out in the STP How is, cool we, is that? we're putting that in the too difficult box. So, um, but we we need this debate. We need this conversation. 
we keep, well, hang on. Look, we keep going on. Is it? We got the House of Lords with its sustainability palaver. Health Select Committee is going to have a go. Look, NHS is sustainable if we fund it properly. End of. All the time we encourage these people to talk about sustainability, we're going to right, encourage them to go down the wrong route. There's two, several different things getting all kind of jumbled yeah. in together here, aren't there? Um, the first is I agree with you about the standards in the NHS. Let's remember that uh, Parliament first set up its uh, inquiry into whether the NHS was sustainable uh, <laughs> five years after it had been set up when we were spending 3% of our GDP on the NHS. So uh, actually we periodically have these debates, but of course uh, that is true. But I don't think that necessarily detracts from the point that even regardless of the funding, nevertheless, there are changes in clinical practice patterns. And how do we kind of work? How do we sort of sort the sheep from the goats uh, in terms of sort of those changes? There are some things where patients will just do better um, if uh, you've got more concentrated um, centers of excellence. There are some things where the trend is in the exact opposite way, where actually, I mean, I spent Saturday uh, evening doing a, uh, a fundraiser uh, for um, a new chemotherapy and dialysis unit at uh, West Berkshire Community Hospital uh, in Thatcham. And you know, at the moment there, people are having to travel to um, the Royal Barks in Reading or to Basingstoke or to Oxford. Uh, the car parking is terrible at the Royal Barks in Reading, as everyone will tell you. Uh, so actually, there's no reason why that can't be much more local. So sort of figuring out what is the localizing approach and what is the centralizing but if the, if approach the, that's kind of what we got to get right. If the SDPs were, were careful about how they went about it, this is a great opportunity I mm. think for, as Simon started when he said, it is local people getting together to fix the stuff that we know needs to be fixed. The, the trouble is I think that they've gone at it uh, um, in, in a rather ham-fisted way and now we've got Jim's talking about rebooting them isn't he, like in January. Well, no, I don't think it's rebooting. I think what we're well, doing is... Well, well, let's well, say... Well, let's say... Maybe you just said booting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big ones. Yeah. No, what, what, what's happening... So, so let's just kind of... For those working in the NHS and kind of, uh, focus on these kind of issues, it's good just to spend a moment on this. Uh, what we're actually using our time on the next sort of month, six weeks, is to try and sort out, uh, divvy up the money uh, for next year and the year after, the 17, 18, 18, 19. And because we've got these SDPs, it means that people can kind of do so in the context of where they're actually trying to get to. So they're not just making kind of tactical decisions that are uh, short-term, smart, long-term, stupid. Having done our best job at trying to make these good decisions for next year and the year after, which we're able to do by Christmas or just thereafter, then obviously we've got a chance to put those together with where the SDPs have got to and then um, actually what we're going to do is we're going to kind of summarise those so that at the national level we can say here's what the NHS is going to do over the next two or three years and we're just going to be very clear about the uh, priorities that we've got, the constraints that we're facing and therefore in practice what we're setting ourselves as our marching orders. I, I think that's very years. helpful because a lot of people just see this yeah. as a bit of a muddle at the moment. Shane, uh, let's come to you and then I'll come to somebody else here and then I'll work my way through. I promise I will work my way through. Um, Shane Tickell, I'm Chief Executive of IMS Maxins. Uh, Our group. sponsors, could you give me a special round of applause? And he's Shane's got a bad back tonight. He's yeah, if you've got coffee. any new backs going, I'd love yeah, one. Um, EPR supplier, and we're a global digital exemplar with Taunton, and we're delighted about that programme, the initiative. But my, my question's going to be about leadership. Um, I had the privilege in October of spending 24 hours travelling with the marvellous blonde and Roy tagged along as we went around the country and visited a dozen sites of hospitals, um, a and &E departments, dementia units, but also some social enterprise, uh, a hostel of recovering uh, drug addicts, and, uh, and then the London uh, uh, Ambulance Service and others. And we saw some amazing, amazing initiatives. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a passionate believer that we all have the opportunity to be leaders and empowerment. And I wanted to ask you about your ethos and any initiatives about developing people right the way across the NHS and healthcare spectrum to, to stand up and do more and deliver on the STPs or whatever the initiatives are. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first up, I think that uh, the vast majority of people, uh, given a fair wind, will want to do the right thing. And so the question is if uh, we've got kind of pressures building, how do we provide the right <laughs> support as against the right? Kind of after the event, uh, you know, marking up people's homework and kind of saying, "Well, that didn't work well, did it?" Uh, um, and the truth is, we've got probably too much effort at the moment, too many about people on the after the event 
homework marking and not enough people on the sleeves rolled up, let's try and fix it. So what we've got to do is we've got to kind of rebalance where the people uh, in different parts of the system are putting their energies. Uh, secondly, I believe that um, although we're a small island, we're actually a large and diverse country and therefore we're trying to make everything the same uh, in terms of how it evolves in every part of England is bound to mean that you don't actually talk about the important stuff. What you end up talking about is the administrative superstructures and that is notepaper because that's the only thing that really can be the same as between Lewisham and Lincolnshire. So if you then get your head in the uh, game that says we're actually going to have to let you know South East London kind of uh, develop in a somewhat different fashion than the sorts of challenges that are being faced in uh, Lincolnshire or the sorts of answers that people are proposing in um, Greater Manchester, then it means you give people the space to kind of focus on what they see as are the necessary things to change. There's a caveat to that, which is that it's a national health service, and so we have to stick with the idea that uh, there are certain sort of founding principles that we hold important to care based on what you need, not what you can pay, certain kind of um, key uh, quality standards that have got to apply uh, across the country. But by and large, not trying to kind of run the whole thing as if it was one big factory. It's not. Uh, right, here we go. Uh, whoa! Hang oh, on, the Harry. Fa the factory managers have uh, yeah, taken the case. Okay. Okay. Harry, no advertising. <laughs> or I'll kill you. Um, question about NHS. How are you on the you mentioned also the, the admin situation. I'm really doing a bit of work with the Royal Island Admin at <laughs> hours service. 1.4% of those calls to Island Hours get an ambulance. But then it's just one on one, it's 8.7%, five times the rate. It's interesting how the devolved nations haven't have looked at one on one and gone, we're not going to do that. Now, it was before your time that the Shah report predicted that ambulance calls would go up, and they have. If this were the route for the GPs, they would also. <laughs> We hate NHS 111, it's a disaster. So what institutional, political, or commercial pressure are making NHS England keep it going? It seems to me a disaster. Well, we're, we're changing it quite substantially in the way that I've just described. So at the moment, about 22% uh, of calls to 111 are getting a clinical uh, contact. And we are intending moving that to 30%, probably with a destination of sort of the 55% zone. That's it. Northern Ireland out of ours, it's 100%. Yeah, well, let's look at that. I don't believe um, on a comparable basis. Uh, and I'll tell you, I mean, we can talk about this afterwards, but the cost of out of hours and 111 together for a year for, for your care in England, we provide you with. 111 and out of hours for a whole year for the cost of less than a cinema ticket. Uh, so the problem actually is that we're probably minimising costs in that part of the system, but the consequence is far too many people are then getting referred to more expensive parts of the system. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at this in the round and say, you know what, it might make more sense to actually have more clinical engagement earlier on in this part of the process if it means fewer people then inappropriately being sent to any. We actually we've gone full circle with this because when it was NHS Direct, it was clinically for clinical front line. It was about fifty-seven pound a call, and then Lansley flogged it off with a nominal twenty-three pound a call, and then it all became call handlers, and that was really when it fell apart. Yeah, and NHS one 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 is handling much higher volumes than NHS Direct. Yes, I, I get that, but I mean the, the point I was making was with the <coughs> clinical front line. I think it, it can work, but of course, as you, you get into the volume game, it gets more and more difficult. Yes, ma'am, would you stand up and be yes. ever so loud? Good evening, everyone. I think one of the uh, best assets of the NHS, NHS is its staff and we know at the moment staff is uh, facing unprecedented uh, demands in, and they feel overstretched, overworked and uh, um, bullying and undermining are right across the board and uh, not to start mentioning what has happened to the junior, con the junior conference last year and it's still happening. How are you tackling this? Well, um, I agree with you that uh, there is huge pressure on uh, frontline staff and services. I think that's uh, absolutely uh, indisputable. It's interesting that despite that, the overall annual patient, uh, sorry, the annual staff survey results show that actually uh, staff engagement with what they're doing uh, in their local hospitals or mental health trusts has gone up. So these two things can be true at once. 
And then when you look at the big differences between organizations, you see that, yes, there's some of this stuff that is, you know, facts about the world. And some of this is actually about the way we arrange and support staff at the local uh, employer level. And I'm not going to kind of uh, name names, but I mean, well, I won't name those that are at the bottom of the pile because you go look them up for yourself. But there are places, um, you know, I think of uh, East London uh, Foundation Trust, I think of uh, Wrightington, uh, Wigan and Lee. I mean, there's quite a lot, I think, of so, uh, quite a long list of places where actually they've been able to do that despite the fact that it is hugely pressurised. So part of the task is ensuring that those uh, issues are as important as everything else people think they deal with because there's a very strong association, as you know, between uh, staff uh, having a sense of uh, pride and control over their work and the quality of care that they're able to offer. This, uh, um, Jim's talking in today about um, the pressures uh, being on trust, the financial pressures, and that shouldn't uh, they shouldn't impact on staffing levels. The safe staffing thing that we start, I don't know what happened with it, what the hell happened, Jane took that on and I don't know what the hell's happened to it. And and Patrick is talking about benchmarking. I mean, everybody's kind of dancing around their handbags on staffing. I'm not sure there's any real clarity. I mean, it seems to me that we that if, you, if you're a chairman or a chief executive of a trust, you bloody well should sort your staff out and should be left to do it. But on the other hand, it's clear that when people want to save money, the first thing they reach for is 70% of their budget, which is the staffing budget. Well, clinical staff numbers have been going up, but so has workload. So it's yeah. not that people across the NHS as a whole, we've got more frontline uh, clinical staff now than we've uh, ever had. But obviously the um, workload has, uh, has risen as well. But I do think we have not necessarily been always completely smart about where we've kind of chose to see our staffing increases. Um, I think within, uh, frankly, within medicine, uh, it is um, unsatisfactory that the uh, number of hospital consultants has been going up three times faster than the number of GPs uh, over, seen over the course of the last decade. I don't think that was a smart choice uh, for the National Health Service. And that's one of the things we've got yeah, to begin to address. I put health and education England on the CQ, on the CQC. I think. Mean, uh, all right, I don't know how the hell we're going to do this. Okay, I'll come. I'll do all this side first, and then I'll do all that side. And I promise, providing we're out of here by about half past eleven. Right. <laughs> okay. Be please, be quick. right. I'll be quick. Okay, Peter Tompkins, a lifelong non-executive director and governor in, in healthcare. Um, I, I am concerned with 44 STPs. They've been put together over a three-month period, two, three-month period. Do you believe that all the big issues have been truly considered, both in the local clusters and in NHSI, NHSE? Have we now got the truth? Are there things that we don't know about, that you know about, that we do need to bring into the wider domain before we make plans moving forward? Because other people say there are things that we do not know about or have not yet been discussed or brought into the wider what, what don't we know about? Well, I don't know. <laughs> 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 That's the thing I want to know about. I won't tell you my sources, but you, I know there are like, things that are not like Donald Rumsfeld. No, 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 no. Like I think it's important. Yeah, yeah, if, no, if you, no, we get the truth. We get the truth. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. Well, these STPs have developed over a sort of six or nine month period. and they are what they are. The fact is that in some parts of the country, people have been kind of working together pretty well and thinking about kind of their broader uh, challenges for some time. And so really, this was just a kind of formalizing of that process. In others, um, strange as it may seem, uh, this was actually the first time that the same people have been in a room together kind of debating the same issues. Uh, and having had, you know, face-to-face -face sessions with folks twice over the course of the last uh, six months as they've been kind of developing their thinking, you could kind of see that this in part was a kind of uh, organizational development uh, intervention as much as, a, as anything else. Um, I mean, they won't mind me saying this, I'm sure, but uh, for example, when we had the uh, discussion with the folks in Kent, um, I mean, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating, there must have been more than 20 people kind of uh, came from every different organization. Uh, and 
this isn't true, but uh, it's a flippant remark, uh, which is that I thought to start with they were all there because they were in violent agreement, but I realised they'd all come to make sure nobody else was saying something daft. Um, but, you know, the leader of the council was there, which was fantastic, uh, from the county council, the leader of Medway uh, was there, uh, all the different trusts and so on. But I don't think there'd really been a big Kent-wide conversation uh, prior to kicking off this process. So the long and short of it is, uh, I'm sure that when you think about Kent, there are more things they need to uh, work through. Uh, and I don't criticise them for the fact they haven't done it yet. Um, it's a journey and people started in different places and they've got to different places. Most of the reconfigurations, I mean, you know, over the years, if you've been around the NHS for long enough, you could almost reconfigure it itself, couldn't you, on the back of a napkin, you know exactly what needs to be done. It's just getting buy-in locally. Uh, right, yes, sir, can you be very brief, please, with your question? Uh, uh, my name is Robert Elkeles. Uh, I'm a retired consultant from Imperial College and board member at Enfield CCG. We know what you see, but what you We know that the vast majority of NHS provider trusts are in serious financial trouble. Would you accept that it is not due to bad management? The last time I met you, sir, I think was here, and I think I detected a familiar resemblance uh, with your son, who is the chief exec of a hospital trust. So are you asking on his behalf? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then right. the question is, so why not? It's, uh, yes, it's, uh, everybody, it's Daniel Elkeles, and he's the uh, trust chief exec down at Epsom and St. Helier, and obviously his dad's worried about Daniel's financial position. So it's <laughs> <laughs> nice of him to it's send a jolly fine trust, along. but they got uh, no money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, point noted. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> okay, yeah. fine. Who's next? <laughs> Anyone coming on this side? So I did cite it. Um, Mr. Klein. Sorry, you were the Would you mind standing up? Are you still able at this late stage? Of <laughs> life. <laughs> 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 um, so you're the first chief exec to come in to the NHS to remake quality rather than raise it as you go out. I think you've made a bit of progress in the last couple of years. So my question is. How do you think we're going to make that sustainable um, after the initial push is over? And of course, the person who really knows the answer to that is Roger. But um, I will, uh, I will give it my, down your my best shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah read my report called Snowy White Peaks. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's all serious. It's Roger done the NHS and the country a huge favour with his colleagues in actually um, holding a mirror up and just kind of. Um, it was a great report. Doubt. It was a great report. I'm just yeah. proving beyond all doubt that it was uh, appalling and unacceptable uh, situation. So, I mean, I think, Roger, as, as we discussed and you know, there are some things that if we get critical mass, I think it won't reverse itself. And this is true of lots of elements of social change, actually. I don't think this country is... I, I think, uh, I mean, if I can use a different example, I think we've come on an enormous distance on marriage equality uh, in this country uh, over 10 or 20 years, and I don't think that's ever going to be put back. Uh, on the other hand, there are some things where you think you've kind of made an advance and then actually it erodes. And I think we've had that experience in the NHS sometimes around uh, workforce race equality. There have been times when actually people have really kind of uh, had a focus and got it, and then we've kind of stepped back. I think we have uh, stepped back uh, since, frankly, the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, around uh, representation on uh, trust boards and, uh, you know, by extension, CCGs as well. Uh, so I think we're making some progress now on uh, board level uh, director uh, representation. I think the um, journey we're on around the workforce race equality standard feedback to individual trusts and, you know, first of all, very gently just kind of showing people did you realise this is kind of the different experiences the staff in your own organisation are having? And then sort of gradually ramping up the volume on that over the course of the next uh, couple of years. I think that's going to be the difference. That, that will ultimately be the test as to whether we have or haven't kind of uh, made this uh, irreversible when we've got a steady stream of senior uh, people, uh, both uh, from a black minority ethnic and uh, other uh, backgrounds, uh, all levels in the NHS, including uh, chief execs, including uh, not just non-execs on the NHS England board, but uh, national directors at uh, NHS England, and the same be true for other national ALBs as well. So it's a, I think we've begun a journey, but we are by no means there. Okay, I'm still working my way back. Uh, yes. Uh, James, James, thank you. Just a finance question. Uh, are the SDPs the death knell of the internal market, and therefore is paid by resource next? 
Um, what was the question? <laughs> Say again. Are the STPs the death knell of the internal market? Well, let's hope so. <laughs> and is PBR next? Uh, well, well, I hope in many respects PBR is next. Uh, yes, because I think if you think about the uh, sort of mix of um, uh, you know, financial incentives and uh, organizational uh, autonomy and um, uh, the sort of regulatory regime that we set up in the early 2000s, it was to try and solve a particular problem for patients in this country. And the problem was that people, the, the number one thing that people were uh, pissed off about was waiting too long for having an operation. And everybody remembers you were waiting 18 months, two years to have your hip, your knee, your cataract. People were waiting more than six months for their uh, uh, cardiac surgery. 500 people a year were dying while waiting on the cardiac surgery waiting list. Uh, and so the question was, how do you put extra money into the NHS and make sure that in a capacity constrained system as it then was in the early 2000s, we buy extra services rather than just frittering it away in inflation. And so you need a set of incentives of which payment by results, payment by activity is one, but to ensure we do that. And you know what? The NHS did brilliantly well. Uh, it demonstrated that if you put the money into the NHS, you will get results out. And so we saw waiting times fall from 18 months to 18 weeks. The median wait for an operation is 10 weeks. We saw a doubling of uh, public satisfaction with the National Health Service. Uh, and we saw big improvements on major killers uh, as well. Cancer, heart disease, other covered by the so-called National Service Remnants. However, that's not now the situation we face. That's not now the problem set that is kind of principally in front of us. The problem in front of us now is not how do we spend another couple of percentage points of GDP and wonderful growth and get good value from it. The question is at a time of huge financial constraint, how do we make sure that we are more than the sum of our parts, that we're dealing with the kind of inefficiencies that are often at the handoff between organisations, that we recognise that it's long-term chronic health conditions that are the principal set of things we've got to get right, and that there are other bits that we've neglected, be it primary care and general practice or mental health services, that are not on a click of the turnstile payment method uh, that we've got to get sorted. So for all of those reasons, I don't think that the policy mix we had in the early 2000s is the policy mix we need now. I do not believe, however, that new Acts of Parliament uh, are a cost-free way of uh, moving from where we've been to where we need to be. And so, in effect, what we're trying to do, uh, as I've sort of said before, is if we collectively act as if the system makes sense, then we stand a greater chance that it will. Oh, that's a great answer. Yes, sir, right at the back. Yeah, my name's John McDonald, uh, and I'm a consultant psychiatrist, so greetings from St George's Hospital. <coughs> Ah, right, yes, hi. Yes, yes, indeed. Do you, is that where you work? Please, yes, you're yeah. other places. I'm also right. a chief clinical information officer. We're trying to do something with digital. Right. Simple question. Um, other organisations which have transformed uh, using digital technology, the first step is to collect the patient's email address mm -hmm. uh, and get the username and a password. Um, currently, my spend on set class stamps, not dictated, <coughs> not consults, time dictated, not typing, mm -hmm. just set class stamps. Is seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year every year. Wow. It's money wasted every year. Can I please email the patient? Well, I mean, it sounds sensible to me, but uh, <laughs> let's talk afterwards and uh, reconnect on old times. <laughs> yeah, I give you a strong maybe, Neil. But can it be very brief, please? Okay. Um, the money question. Um, I'm a baby boomer. Quite a lot of people here in the room are baby boomers. Um, in the 80s, Mrs. Thatcher took away our interest tax and used it to spend on public services. In the 90s, Ken Clark did full fuel escalators and lots of other cutting plants and took money off the middle classes. In the 90s, Charles Clark brought in tuition fees and made middle classes pay anything up to 40, 45,000 for the education of the kids. These were huge redistributions. The NHS and the government stumbled over Dilbert to make the baby boomers pay, and the middle class baby boomers pay their share. As the chief exec of the NUS, do you regret or resent the fact that you have not had the largesse that has been given to university vice chancellors and the transfer of money that ought to happen between the generations through some mechanism like Dilbert? Well, I think we're right to the honourable member of your answer. <laughs> no, no, I think it's a, it's a very, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting um, 
uh, line of argument. I think two things about uh, the social care element of this, given you're talking about Dill not, and I, as I understand it, the government is not. Um, but it, uh, the government's position uh, is still that they intend to do Dill not in uh, 2020. I think that's their, uh, their continues to be their stated <coughs> be that as it may. Um, first of all, I think there are some tactical things that can be done around social care uh, funding now that don't require you to kind of reimagine beverage or the welfare state. Um, but secondly, I do think there is a debate to be had uh, post-2020 about what is the uh, sort of retirement deal uh, uh, that we offer to keep people, not just, um, oh, no, keep older people, not just uh, uh, in income security, but also housing security and care security. And I think uh, it was interesting that the Chancellor in the autumn statement uh, said that uh, they intended to take a hard look at the triple lock um, post-2020, uh, which, uh, depending on how they uh, think about that, might give more flexibility in this space. And I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> right, right, I'm going to move from the back, yes. Uh, Weenus. Hi, my name is uh, Nick from Meet Communities. Uh, I'm wearing two hats, so I might squeeze in two questions, but both very quick. I doubt you will. You are um, <laughs> uh, clearly very passionate about the NHS, uh, the patients, the workforce. Um, I have in my hand about 200,000 very passionate healthcare workers on Twitter. Um, is there any chance you can join us sometime soon? Because your access to your knowledge and support uh, would be fantastic. Um, so that's the first question. Uh, the other question um, is, I am over 40, I'm becoming less overweight by the day, um, but I can't do anything about the fact that I'm probably going to keep away from genetic heart condition. Um, I know this, my GP doesn't know this, A&E doesn't know this. When are we going to unlock our data and get really preventative? Um, the NHS use of data policy says that you cannot look at my data until I present myself to a service. Um, we're going to get preventative and we're going to get smart and we're going to get efficient. How are we going to start using this data to find the people that need help before we know it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've We've been got an expert in the... on data sitting here yeah. as well, right in the front. Yeah, what's the answer? <laughs> You're drawing a blank down there. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'd, I'd love to chat actually about the, the last of your, your points there. I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think you make an important uh, point. Obviously, Fiona Caldicott has been looking at these kind of issues and um, the Department of Health due to kind of uh, set out the stall on this. Um, I was, um, it was, I thought, notable that the Information Commissioner uh, within the last few days has sided with NHS Digital uh, in terms of the um, approach that NHS Digital are taking to making uh, anonymised data available for researchers. Obviously what you're talking about is something different, which is um, personalised uh, data that would be available. I don't understand off the top of my head, why, if you consent, those kind of data shouldn't be available on an expanded version of the summary care record, uh, and that uh, it wouldn't feed into kind of more proactive uh, support for you um, ahead of your ending up in an A&E department or your GP I surgery. Think, I but I think, think that this is a coming conversation. I think it'll be really important, by the way, that voices like yours are helping inform the public debate on this so that it doesn't just become a question about respecting people's rights to confidentiality, which obviously is entirely appropriate, but you also... But it is, but it is being done. If you look at Healthy Liverpool, for example, uh, we went up and saw it, uh, and right across Liverpool, they, they, made, they made all the records available right across. Now, I have to tell you, it was a gargantuan job. It involved 3,000 consent documents, uh, which was, you know, horrendous, but they've done it, and it is being modelled, I think, on the Wirral. Is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So Gary Price and we're we're a global digital exemplar. Can we've you stand got, up? We've got a population health system that links um, primary care, secondary care, community care. Uh, all the information comes in, in in a cloud model, and now we've got access to all that information. Um, that was three hundred thousand population, and we had to introduce an opt out rather than opt in. We got a few thousand opted out. But we got the vast majority. Yeah, it, but it, uh, it is an absolutely you know it's a dog's, dog's job to have to do. The, um, I should explain. Gary's been shadowing me for the day. That's why he's here tonight, and, he, and he's just thinking, what in God's name did he let himself in for? Uh, right, uh, where are we going? A lady here uh, with the black. Give us the Twitter answer. Uh, yes, I think if that was deliberate. Right, <laughs> <laughs> I'll save him. Hello, Sarah Wilton. Um, oh, you're Sarah Wilton. Yeah. 
We've been waiting to hear from you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is absolutely committed in their hearts to free NHS care delivered at the point of need. But in our heads, we're starting to increasingly realise that that's just not going to be possible, however hard we try, however many SDPs we deliver. Isn't it really time that we started to bite the bullet, the silver bullet, the ch challenge? bravely, intelligently, and look at the best practice in Europe and start to introduce something that enables a bit more contribution, whether it's an insurance system or whatever. We just don't seem to even look at it, discuss it in this country, and I think that we've clearly got not got enough funding, and that's surely an answer. I don't understand why we're not looking at it. How would you do it then? Well, I'd look around Europe at best practice in France, and there are insurance schemes in France that some people who can afford it pay a very small amount as part of their employment taxes and 10%, 20% of the health budget. What, what is their GDP? What, what, how, what percentage of GDP? I think they spend more than we do. Well, there already. you are. There's your answer. Mm. Well, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, uh, for, for a start, I think I challenge the premise of your question. I'm not sure that the heads, let alone the hearts of the British people, are where you think the heads of the British people are. And I think one way of answering the question is to see what their elected representatives kind of infer to be the uh, views of the British people. And so I thought it was quite revealing that um, although during this highly, uh, you know, contested uh, referendum debate, uh, the NHS wasn't on the ballot paper, but it was on the side of the battle bus. Uh, so if you're kind of making uh, big pitches to the British people about a well-funded NHS, uh, that tells me that uh, actually the calculations that a lot of people are making is a bit different than the one you're making. Um, but even putting that to one side, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, Germany decided on its uh, health financing system in 1883. Uh, Bismarck was the first um, politician to think that having the state in some way involved in uh, shaping healthcare financing would be kind of good for politicians. And in 1911, Lloyd George copied that, for GPs at least. And then in 1946, we decided to go a different way. There are very few examples of countries having kind of through accident of history, chosen a particular funding model, then choosing to kind of switch. And the idea that at a time when we are <coughs> going through the Brexit process, we are uh, dealing with all of the pressures on um, uh, our employers, businesses, labour costs and so on. The idea that we would sort of load another um, 8 to 10 percent of GDP onto the cost of employing people uh, through the workforce, I think is implausible. I, and I think it's worth pointing out that we're putting 6.3 percent of GDP into healthcare at the moment, and it was 6.3 percent back in the year 2000. There is just not enough money in the system. Now that's a political choice. Uh, we, uh, well, it, it's, uh, well, you know, there's an election coming, and you, you know what we've got to do. But the, the yeah, you know, <laughs> kick the bastards. And at this point, I mean, uh, it's sort of a Trumpian style. Lily announces his candidacy for yeah. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. With his uh, gentleman with his hand up there. So I'm working my way forward, and I'll come to Michael last year. Uh, Andrew Gardner. I mean, it's very much on the theme of some of the other questions we've been looking at the. Demand on primary care. <coughs> and one in Who's we? Uh, maybe uh, We look into the front end, and 10% of the patients drive 50% of the appointments into primary care. Mm -hmm. We want to do two things. We want to have a digital front end that gets access into the GP record. Mm -hmm. And we think you need apps which can change behaviour because a lot of those 10% have a bit of higher than anybody else to have diabetes. Mm -hmm. They need behavioural change, yep. not medicine. What are we doing to you know, make sure that EMIS and TPP open up their information for digital to take off? And are we going to get nice to allow us to prescribe uh, wellness apps like that? Because I jumped to the back at the beginning. Unless we do prevention, we will still have a massive demand on the system. Yeah, I don't think we necessarily need nice to account of. Uh, Give that the uh, give that the go ahead, but uh, your, your point is a, is a good one. Um, we are um, actually over the course of the next uh, six months going to be. Uh, I mean, a number of GP groups have, or either developed their own or are working with third parties around the kind of approach to digital front end that you describe, and um, so we are we are over the next six months uh, going to be supporting 
are some parts of the country where they're using homegrown versions and some parts of the country where they're using third-party solutions. So it sounds like you should be talking to uh, some of the folks who are working on that and uh, see whether that's something that can be tried. In, in the States yesterday, they announced a more uh, rigorous uh, examination of health apps. And uh, you know, I think we're probably likely to see something like that happening here because there is a lot of stuff on the market that really pro probably shouldn't be there if you're really going to trust it with your with your health. But I, I agree with you. The, the, I mean, if you look at organizations like EMIS and so on, they're proprietary brands. They don't have to open their back end if they don't want to, unless we do something about interoperability. And that's within our gift. I mean, we could, we could be much tougher, I think, on interoperability at the moment. We just palaver about and say, would you all talk nicely together? I just say, I would say, we won't buy stuff that isn't interoperable, and that's it. That's probably killed our sponsorship for next year. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> yes, sir, gentlemen here. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Jackson, passionate about uh, people leadership. You're stuck in a lift while well, you're travelling. If you've got about 60 seconds, thinking <laughs> about our next generation of healthcare practitioners, doctors, nurses, hockey, health, any, anyone, what would be your message to them if they were thinking about a career as a leader of the NHS? If they were thinking about a career in in, in medicine and healthcare, yeah. or in as management, you've been talking about or anything, anything in the yeah. anything. Nurses, doctors, health, what would be your message? Well, if, if the question is, uh, why would you want to come be a health professional uh, in the NHS? I think the answer is uh, because um, these are um, jobs that are um, highly worthwhile in that you're doing something hugely important uh, for uh, patients and for communities. They are intellectually stimulating. Uh, they involve uh, lots of teamwork and they give you enormous flexibility over the course of your career, over where you'll be working and what you'll be doing. Step on down. <laughs> but it's, it's a good answer. The, the, uh, it's interesting that the Secretary of State was talking the other day, wasn't he, about more clinicians in, in management. And he got himself into a bit of a tangle with the Health Service Journal, over there, or the Health Service Journal got themselves into a bit of a tangle over there, I should say. The, I mean, there's a strong sense of vocation in becoming a clinician, isn't there? Um, you know, it's often runs in the family and all that kind of thing. To come in as a manager into the NHS, I'm not saying there isn't a strong sense of vocation because there is, but it is increasingly difficult to attract people to the top line jobs. 20% I think it is of top jobs as managers in the NHS are now vacant or have an interim. It is becoming tougher and tougher to, to hold down the big jobs and it's getting tougher and tougher to get people to do it. Yeah, these are these are tough jobs. Um, I think there's a few kind of other um, sort of facts that would be worth just kind of inserting into the conversation on this point. First is that, of course, the majority of management done in the NHS has already been done by clinicians. Yes. Uh, so most, uh, you know, partners leading uh, GP practices uh, are GPs, or they might be practice managers, nurses, but by and large, it's GPs. In hospitals, most of the management, uh, with a little M, is actually being done by ward sisters and charge nurses, uh, together with uh, heads of uh, physio, uh, you know, therapy departments, uh, scientists, and so on. And in terms of the medical disciplines, uh, most hospitals have a clinical directorate system uh, that has a doctor or a senior clinician as the clinical director. Uh, so really, this debate has been a debate about uh, chief executives. And the truth is, we need both and. We need kind of to give ourselves the best of both. <coughs> and in NHS England, I mean, I've employed um, a guy called Jonathan Fielden, who was the uh, medical director of University College Hospital, as our director of specialised services. Fantastic clinician, Eustace, former chairman of the BMA Consultants Commission. I like that. Um, we uh, have employed uh, Arvin Madden, uh, run our GP uh, services, uh, but I've also employed Callie Palmer, chief exec of the Royal Marsden, to be our national cancer director, and Claire Murdoch, a former nurse, to be our national uh, mental health director. So I think, you know, we're a team of 1.3 million people. We've got brilliant talents to choose from. And the other point I would just make, Roy, is that despite all of the talk about kind of, uh, you know, the pressures and the challenges on management roles, the NHS Graduate Management Training Scheme uh, is one of the highest regarded and most oversubscribed by the best and the brightest graduates, beating uh, the applications you get uh, for many others, be it, uh, you know, in some years, uh, more than the uh, BBC and uh, Goldman Sachs and Procter and Gamble and British Airways and the Civil Service and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. So actually, bright, committed young people want to come and work in the NHS 
and they want to come and work in NHS management. They do. And I, I was speaking to the management uh, uh, trainees and guys just recently, mm -hmm. and it was interesting. I went around the table and asked them why, given all the, the crap there is in the NHS, why they wanted to do it. And they said, well, because there's crap in the NHS. They were kind of inspired by... Well, the, I, joined, by the challenge. I joined the NHS in 1988 in the management of yes, the NHS, and it wasn't all going swimmingly in 1988 either. <laughs> I, I, I can't, well, I joined in 1974, and I can't remember a time when it ever went swimmingly. <laughs> uh, where, where are we going? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Kristen Hall from the Chief Nurse at BHRUT. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the Chief Nurse Award and the Chief Nurse We're in the presence of greatness here. Mind what you say. <laughs> um, I like a number of Chief Nurses struggle to recruit people, so spend a lot of money on banking agencies. Mm -hmm. In April, I went to the Philippines and recruited 155 Filipino nurses who should have been here by October to help me with my agency spend and to ensure that the patients get the right care. To date, I've got four. They're completely blocked coming into the country for a number of reasons, and I just wonder if there's anything that can be done to help us get these nurses to help us look after the patients in a more consistent fashion. Yeah, well, we should certainly look at, I mean, I think it's, it's often a combination of uh, visas and NMC uh, registration, isn't it? And I know that the NMC have been looking at how they streamline their processes uh, internationally as well as domestically. Uh, but I'm sure um, Ruth May at uh, NHSI will be very keen to work with you on what that looks like. I think we've got to be realistic about Brexit and what it means to the NHS and myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was with some Portuguese nurses recently who were saying they were going home because they weren't certain whether they could stay because they realised they were going to be used as bargaining chips in keeping grannies on the Costa del Sol. <laughs> I mean, we just got to accept the fact, understand the environment within which we're, our business activity is taking place. Uh, and it's, you know, I would expect Simon to, to agree with this or not, but I mean, it's Brexit that's screwing this whole thing up because if you look at the net migration figures that were announced last week, you know, it's going completely in the wrong direction for the government's point of view. And if you really think they're going to start shipping in loads of uh, nurses from overseas, I think you've got another thing coming. We've got to be more creative in our solutions because I don't think that we're going to be in the present political climate. I don't think it's going to be easy to depend on bringing in nurses from overseas.